Okay, let's get started. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. My name is Mike Ivanov. I'm the Senior Director of Product Marketing here at DataCore. Uh, we have an exciting webinar for you today. As many of you know, on January 26th, uh, DataCore made the announcement that we've acquired Coringo. And with us today, we have Adrian Herrera, who is from Coringo. He's our product marketing uh, principal for the object storage, or uh, the Swarm product um, that is now coming over with DataCore. And we're gonna go through an overview of that um, product line with you. Uh, just a reminder for everyone, everyone is on mute, but if you have any questions, you can send them through the question panel or the chat panel, and we'll monitor those throughout the webinar, and we'll ask them as we go, or we can uh, add them all up at the end and ask the questions at the end of the session. So with that, I would like to introduce everyone to Adrian Herrera. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Adrian Herrera, as Mike mentioned. Mike, thank you for that introduction. And I am in charge of product marketing for object storage at DataCore. I came over from the Coringo acquisition where I headed marketing before Coringo. I was uh, one of the initial employees at an enterprise cloud storage company called Nirvonics. So I have a lot of experience in object storage and cloud storage services. So first, uh, a quick introduction to DataCore. I, I assume since everyone here is from uh, DataCore promoted material that you're familiar with DataCore. Although, um, you know, we'll give a quick overview. DataCore is a leader in software defined storage. Uh, they've always focused, our data core has always focused on block, file, and object. With the acquisition of Coringo, brings deeper, more robust product offerings on the object storage side, and that's really what we're going to focus on today. First, I wanted to take a step back and define what object storage is. I think there, there's still a lot of confusion in the market. When, when we talk about object storage, we're actually talking about a way to address and store information on storage media. So object storage or pure object storage goes all the way to how data is stored and addressed on the actual disk, magnetic disk or SSD. You can see the different structures. We'll start on the left. Block storage presents a LUN or a volume. It's primarily meant for transactional data. You install an operating system or an application on top of uh, the volume or the LUN that's presented. File data is hierarchical in nature. There is a file system that manages all the interaction between the underlying subsystems and the front end application. Usually that's done via, or data transfer is done via some form of application and data is stored in directories, subdirectories, and file names. There is uh, some bit of metadata, usually system metadata stored with those files. Uh, for instance, when a file is created, when it was last modified, that kind of information. Object storage is a little different. Object storage or pure object storage the data is stored on a disk and the system gives a key back to the application that is storing that information. You can think of it almost like a, a valet, which is a good analogy. When you take your car to be parked, the valet gives you your ticket. They take and park your car. You don't really care where they park your car, just as long as it isn't damaged or scratched when you get it back. When it's time to get it back, you give the valet your ticket, they bring you back your car. Object storage is, is the same way. The reason that object storage is that way is because when, when you're able to do that without a file system, you're able to continuously move data around the system and optimize the utilization of the underlying infrastructure resources. And that's because the data is no longer attached to a specific location or locked in a specific location like it is with file. In, in file, you, the, the underlying data all the way to disk is in a particular subdirectory on a particular server in a data center somewhere. Same with block, you have your volume, you have your LUN. Object is a little more flexible. And that's why there are differences also when you talk about performance. Block performance, file performance is usually me me measured in IOPS input output operations per second where object storage you're talking more throughput how much data per second can you move through your particular connection or to the particular application so we just wanted to level set when we talk about object storage that's what we're talking about 
in 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 the market, you know, a lot of vendors present object interfaces, which is fine. You know, S3 in and of itself is an object interface, but just because you're presenting object interfaces doesn't mean the underlying data is stored as object storage. And we'll talk about the value in pure object storage devices and appliances today. With the addition of Swarm, DataCore now has the most complete software-defined storage portfolio in the market. DataCore has always done a tremendous job on, on the Sand Symphony side, on the block side. Sand Symphony has been around for, for quite some time. It's, it's a known leader in the space. They recently uh, introduced vFilo, or we recently introduced vFilo, which added file processes. So on Sand Symphony, it's ideal for databases, performance, hungry, and critical applications and VDI. So the, the addition of vFilo brought NAS aggregation for distributed file systems and really optimized data placement, uh, whether that's on-prem within your, your storage environment, heterogeneous storage environment, or in the cloud. And what Swarm brings is global data management, media management, backup. It really brings a, a scalable pool of storage that you can use for any unstructured data. So essentially, it is more of a, a storage target if you're coming in through vFilo or any external application. And of course, the entire comprehensive product portfolio is flexible, uh, it delivers performance, availability, scalability, because it is software defined. When, when we talk about best fit, we wanna focus on the top, the blue boxes there. Sand Symphony and vFilo are really about building new or aggregating ex existing storage infrastructure where Swarm is really meant to bring new, massively scalable storage. So that's, that's the difference. Uh, you know, we could start on the left where you see existing data, uh, primary access, primary use, typical range. I'll walk you through the, the table from left to right. So from the Sand Symphony perspective, it, it's really seen as a sand controller. Uh, from the existing data perspective, it, it's used to assimilate data from existing SAN. The primary access methods for SAN Symphony, iSCSI or fiber channel, primary use, as we mentioned before for block, it's usually a high transaction, so it's about random write access. The typical ranges range anywhere between the 10 to 200 terabyte range, and the data structures are volumes or LUNs. That's what's presented to uh, the, 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 the end user to use. So it's, it's, a, it's a blank space. To, to install applications, to run applications. From the vFilo perspective, it's used to assimilate data from existing NASs to eliminate storage silos across the corporation, usually within a WAN or, or LAN within an existing uh, environment. The primary access methods are NFS and SMB. There are other access methods. These are just the primary access methods. The primary use is collaboration. So it's following the, the primary use of, of existing NASs. The typical ranges range from the 20 terabytes to the one petabyte range, and the data structure, as, we, as I showed on the previous slide, is hierarchical. Now, on the Swarm side, the existing data, you really need to ingest it from existing locations, NAS, tape, or net new locations, some other application that's creating data. The primary access methods are S3 or HTTP. You start to see that these are internet-based pro protocols, uh, usually RESTful interfaces, which makes it very easy to access data from remote sites or distributed sites, and to also provide that type of secure access within a LAN or within a WAN. Primary uses are archive and, and delivery, and the typical ranges range from the 100 terabyte to uh, the, the multiple petabytes, hundreds of petabytes range. The data structure, as we discussed in the previous slide, is key value. So it is, it is different. You can see that you know, when we have the key value data structure, it just makes the storage in, infinitely scalable, massively scalable. So let's take a deeper dive on data core swarm. So this is setting the stage again what 
Swarm actually is. It is intelligent data management for content access, delivery, and archive. You'll notice I didn't say object storage in there. Object storage is an enabling technology. At its core, Swarm is object storage, but it does so much more than a typical object store. Your object storage has been maybe it, it, it's been known as being cheap and deep storage out there in the market. Sure, it is economical. Sure, it scales. But best of breed solutions like Swarm include a lot more functionality, a lot more value, and we'll go over that today. Swarm lets you scale from terabytes to exabytes with minimal administration. And it's a software appliance, flexible and economical. You'll notice again that I, I said software appliance. There is um, there's a lot of functionality in Swarm. We'll talk about deployment models, but you know, Swarm, the ideal scenario for Swarm is being installed in, in a VM or being installed in bare metal where, where Swarm controls the actual appliance, whether that's a virtual appliance or whether that's the, the server and server resources. And we'll talk about why in the coming slides. Swarm is also proven. It's, it's been around since 2006. Uh, it is on version 12 code. So it's, it's market hardened. You know, as we come into the data core portfolio, we, we bring those decades of experience with us and decades of hardening with us. This means that the lessons learned from these hundreds of deployments in different verticals now are available to data core customers. The focus for Swarm has been in media entertainment, high performance computing, and federal and local governments, but there are also a lot of customers in the healthcare and medical space, in the general IT space, in, in just about every, every industry and, and, and every region in the world. You'll notice some very recognizable names. We'll walk through some of these uh, in, in coming slides from the use case perspective where we talk about target use cases for Swarm. But first, I want to talk high level about the problems solved by Swarm. Swarm can be used not only for providing massively scalable storage, but it could also be used for file sharing, file streaming directly from the storage layer. That's a benefit of object storage. Most object storage out there in the market is accessible via HTTP. So when you do that, you can access the underlying content as HTTP and when it's stored as a key value in, in a key value method, it's very easy to deliver that directly from the storage layer. That's why object storage is used to enable all of the major cloud storage services out there in the market. So whether you're talking about Amazon 3 or Azure or even Box or Dropbox, uh, or even some of the most popular video delivery sites out there like Netflix and Disney streaming services, they all have object stores storing their content as, as the foundation or storing their users' content as a foundation of their services. Multi-site collaboration. So Swarm includes replication or the ability to replicate data to various sites, the ability to send data to different sites uh, using the S3 protocol for backup and DR purposes. It was very easy to set up multi-site collaboration workflows with Swarm. There's a UI for it. It's very easy to set up. As I mentioned earlier, you could scale to petabytes, hundreds of petabytes with minimal administration. This is one thing that the, the team at Coringo has focused on, and, and I know the team at DataCore is going to continue to focus on is working on some of the market's most advanced automation technology to make tedious manual management efforts uh, very easy to handle at scale. And of course, compliance and protection. The roots of, of Swarm actually started in content addressable storage, which was used for compliance purposes. There are a lot of those features and functionality still in Swarm the ability to store content as immutable objects, the ability to support worm use cases, uh, the ability to add upgradable hashes called integrity seals in case, uh, there, in case a hashing algorithm used was compromised. There are a lot of those compliance features uh, built in. And of course, there, 
Swarm provides the most efficient way to protect data, offering the ability to mix erasure coding and replication on the same server in, in the same bucket. We'll go over what that means in a bit. So let's talk about target workloads. So we talked about the problems that Swarm solves. We talked about the, the market hardened uh, technology. Here are a few target workloads that hopefully you can identify out there in the field. Maybe you're experiencing some of these issues if you're a customer uh, for our channel partners. Maybe you know your customers are experiencing these today. Swarm would be a great fit for solving these issues. In the media impairment space, Swarm is already used for video on demand uh, services, for streaming services, for active archives. In the enterprise IT space, it's used as secondary storage for backup, for DR, for hybrid cloud. In the healthcare space, it's primarily used for medical records. Uh, so it, Swarm is used uh, at, at both uh, NHI and NIH, um, the, the National Institute of Health and the National Health Institute, uh, one's here in the US and one's, one's in Taiwan. And it's used to store the medical images and, and medical information in a way that can be easily accessed by different applications both for analysis and, and in the line of providing healthcare services. Uh, going back in media entertainment for video on demand solutions, I, I didn't mention this, but we're not only used for typical media entertainment services like, like you would think of, like, like some of the streaming services and broadcast services, you saw the NEP logo, but we're also used for, for sports teams uh, worldwide. So for some of the smaller sports teams that want to provide access to their content for their training staff to be able to view what's going on in different locations. It's not just about delivering broadcast and services to the entire world. It's also about being able to securely share content to those within your organization. Automotive and I IoT, uh, the the way that Swarm is architected makes it extremely portable. We'll, we'll go into what that means in a bit, but it makes it ideal for edge use cases and IoT use cases. HPC, we have a number of customers in the HPC space, including some of the world's largest research organizations, uh, both in the EMEA region and, and in, the, in the United States. They're typically storing geospatial or, or research information in, uh, uh, in some way. Because of the way that Swarm is architected, the parallel architecture of Swarm makes it perform better at scale. All nodes do the same thing. We don't rely on caching layers to provide performance. So as the cluster grows, performance and capacity actually grow with the cluster you can approach parallel file system like performance for S3 with, with Swarm. And then of course, government, uh, government isn't, um, or uh, federal and local government, it, it, it is, it's kind of this mix between a, a vertical and horizontal use cases, but governments use us to store evidence information, to store video and deliver video, uh, to store information or evidence that, that, that's collected in, in different court systems. So we're, we're used by the Brazilian federal court system. Uh, we are used by the Department of Defense here in the U.S., Department of Justice. Very you know, highly secure deployments that need to have their data available in a massively scalable way. So a lot of these deployments are approaching uh, tens of petabytes. I believe our, our largest deployment in the government space right now is approaching 60 petabytes. So you know they they started with a few petabytes and they scaled all the way to that 60 petabytes over the course of a few years. And here are some sample use cases, just showing how Swarm would be integrated into existing workflows. This by no means is an exhaustive list. This is just meant to give you a few examples of how Swarm fits into existing workflows. From the Active Archive perspective, we'll start here at the top left-hand corner. Here's where Swarm sits. It can sit behind primary storage. It sits behind applications. This uh, interface here can be S3, it could be SMB, it could be NFS, or you can actually integrate the Swarm API directly into proprietary applications. 
typically in an active archive use case, there's some sort of editing or collaboration going on in the primary storage. And once that editing or collaboration is done, that data is then moved to Swarm servers where you can manage that data. We'll, I'll show an example of, of the UI coming, coming up here, but this is where Swarm is different. Uh, you can edit metadata directly on a web-based UI. You can search for content stored on Swarm. The UI also enables search and, and self-servicing for end users. You can stream that content directly from the storage layer, as, as mentioned. You can replicate data to an off-site site, uh, off, off -site site for DR purposes, or you can send to any one of the major clouds for DR purposes. Speaking of DR, let's move to the right. Uh, you can, again, use Swarm to create a DR and backup to cloud. You have your appliances, your applications, your end users. You go ahead and you set up a backup feed directly on the Swarm UI to any one of the cloud services that supports the, the S3 API and everything is, is handled for you. Video on demand streaming here in the lower left hand corner. Again, this is a typical workflow that you would see. You would have the, the actual media that is recorded. You have it captured and recorded. You would have some sort of processing into the environment from the primary storage. An asset manager typically coordinates the transcoding and the other workflow, the production workflow. Then that data would get sent to the Swarm servers. Uh, for video on demand or origin storage and archive and then it could be sent to different locations either for remote collaboration internal content streaming or sharing public viewing so this would be the typical origin storage or video on demand storage uh, deployment and then here in the lower right hand corner you have remote and distributed workflows so Swarm would sit here again behind primary storage. This is usually storage that is provided with uh, one of maybe, maybe a, a high-end microscope, or this is a primary storage where all your satellite imagery is stored. It would write the data directly to Swarm uh, after, after it's on the primary storage. And then you can provide secure access to local or remote researchers. You can send that data to the cloud. You can send it to different locations um, that have a, a Swarm stored software installed. So you know, lot, lots of different workflows. Just wanted to give you an example. Uh, again, this is not meant to be an exhaustive list. It's just meant to show you the, the flexibility of Swarm and set the stage for some of the features that, that we're going to go over. Again, I, I do encourage you to, to reach out to your data core representative if you're interested in learning more about some of these use cases, and, and we do have some internal resources that, that do deeper dives on, on some of these, these specific use cases. But you start to see the, the differences between you know, different storage technologies where you can deliver content directly from the storage layer, you can manage content directly on the storage layer. So it, it's, we bring a, an added set of functionality of you know, ability to not only search massive amounts of content, but also organize and deliver massive amounts of content. Key customer benefits. This is where we start stepping into the value of Swarm over being economical storage. You'll notice the last bullet here is lower storage costs. With a lot of other you know, object storage solutions out there, they lead with scalability and the ability to provide economical storage. Yes, Swarm does that, but it also does a lot more. And we'll walk into all of these key customer benefits one by one. So as I mentioned, we eliminate complexity and streamline deployment. This is a direct quote from a customer that was taken by one of the major analysts out there in the market and one person working part time was able or working part time on on storage infrastructure was able to manage over thirty petabytes of gear this This isn't just the swarm software, but this is the hardware that swarm software is installed on. 
the reason they can do that is because of the automation and the way that Swarm is deployed. deployed. Swarm is a complete software appliance. The ideal deployment scenario for Swarm is installed on a new x86 or old x86 server, you know, a, a blank x86 server, I should say, with HDDs or SSDs installed. The software actually runs from RAM which means that 95% of the capacity of the hard drives or the SSDs is left for content. With other solutions, you need to specify a set of SSD drives in each chassis for the metadata database. You also need to specify some portion of the hard drive space for the operating system. That's not the case with Swarm. Everything, the software runs from RAM, there's only a very light journal installed on the disk, which leaves most of the actual space capacity for your files, for your content. This also means there's no file system. You don't need to really worry about RAID or LUN management. The metadata is stored with the objects themselves on the drives, so you also don't need to worry about managing an additional database. The metadata, both system and custom metadata, is protected with the objects themselves. So you can increase or decrease the durability of every object that's stored on the solution at any time. We'll go over that in a bit too. This means that you can boot from bare metal. Once the initial cluster is set up and deployed, adding additional capacity is very easy. You just install the new chassis, make sure it is uh, it is seeable, it, it is um, that, that you can see it from the cluster, and the new resources will be, will be automatically assumed into the cluster. There's no additional setup needed. You can also mix and match hardware. You can mix and match x86 servers. You can mix and match different hard drive sizes, different SSD sizes, so, so it's very, very flexible. If a drive was to go down, you don't need to fix it uh, in, uh, immediately. You can just, the, the system will go ahead and recover on its own and it'll keep on going. So because of all of these features and more, system administrators can do more with, with their time. They can focus on other parts of the infrastructure. This just makes it very easy to streamline deployment. And this is what we mean when we focus on, or when, when, when we focus on automation and automating a lot of tasks that are manual with other stored solutions. Part of simplifying infrastructure management is being able to see what goes on. This means you not only need to see the underlying storage infrastructure, but you also need to plug into existing monitoring platforms that you may have. Swarm offers a management UI. It's based upon HTML5. It's a responsive device, so you can view it, or it's a responsive design, so you can view it from any device with a current browser. Your your tablet, your mobile device, your your laptop, you know, wherever you are, if you have a browser, you can log in and see the status of the cluster. You see examples of the UI here on the right. We also plug into monitoring platforms. So there, there is an API that collects system information that could be used to plug into Prometheus. Uh, in fact, we we have done that, and we also provide a, a Grafana dashboard, uh, a template for you. So, you know, Grafana is a way to visualize the data that, that's, that's exported from the Prometheus API. Uh, via Prometheus, you can also plug into monitoring and alerting. Of course, it, when, when you sign up for a support package, we also offer monitoring and alerting services. But this gives you lots of ways to be able to view the status of the cluster not only via the web-based UI, but also plugging into different and, and very popular alerting, alerting and monitoring platforms and actually seeing that data via visualization, data visualization platforms like Grafana. And this is all powered by uh, Elasticsearch and a lot of the, the, the data that we collect in Elasticsearch. We also have integrated Elasticsearch. So when we talk about search, What's enabling that and powering that is Elasticsearch. I don't specifically call that out 
I call it out once in the coming in, in the uh, coming slides. But I want everyone to know that this is powered by Elasticsearch, so you get a lot of the great development and advancements that that are going on in the Elasticsearch and the entire Elk stack available to you. Simplify tenant management. Now, tenant management is defined differently by different organizations. At with via swarm we're talking more about the private cloud notion of tenant it, it we're, or i should say we're we're adding on the private cloud notion of tenants so it's not just about enabling access to underlying infrastructure for applications uh, but it's also about providing secure access to end users letting them self-service for certain aspects of, of what they would need, self-service for searching content, self-service for seeing uh, how much of their quota, a storage quota, bandwidth quota they have used. So these are all functions that are built into Swarm. That's why organizations like BT, British Telecom, use Swarm to enable their enterprise cloud storage services. You can easily manage thousands of tenants. This is very important for specific use cases, especially in the HPC world where, where they need to provide secure access to content to distributed researchers across the globe. Uh, Swarm does connect directly to enterprise identity management solutions like LDAP, Active Directory, and Linux PAM, but it can also plug into token-based authentication. It also supports certain uh, single sign-on platforms. You can get as fine-grained as you want with access controls. And of course, we talked about flexible system administration. Uh, the, the point to, to really focus on here is this is all controlled on the server. This is all controlled via the web-based UI or the API. So at any time you want to revoke access, you can go ahead and do that. There are a lot of organizations that are still managing access to content via spreadsheets. They are actually giving root level access to underlying infrastructure to people externally outside of their organization, or they're setting up a, an FTP server to be able to send you know, large files uh, across the world each each one of those solutions you know has has worked but they are very very difficult to manage at scale and they require manual management you can eliminate all all of that manual management by using swarm so you could see it's not just about infrastructure management it's also about content management and tenant management and we'll we'll go over content management here in a bit you can meet any unstructured data workload, I specify unstructured data workload uh, because Swarm is meant for unstructured data. It's, it's not meant for databases or high transaction environments. San Symphony is a great solution for that. In the unstructured world, we're talking media, videos, files, photos. Uh, you can really scale up or architect a solution to meet your performance requirements, your retention requirements. Swarm is adaptive, self-healing, self-managing, auto load balancing, we saw the value of that where one system administrator can manage 30 petabytes in the previous screen. As I mentioned, the nodes are symmetric. The, the graphic here in the lower right-hand corner is really a visual representation of the way that requests come into Swarm. There, a request can be made to any node within the system, and that node directs the request to the most optimal location within the cluster. So you could see that as a cluster grows, you have more nodes bidding on a specific request, and it's just a very, very highly efficient way to store and deliver massive amounts of data. And again, this provides high throughput. So all, all, of, all of the underlying resources are, are, are pooled and and it's the system that determines the most optimal location, most optimal place to either store or return a request. Ensure long-term data availability. This is really where a lot of object storage solutions shine. Typically, if you were storing something for very large periods of time, you were using tape. 
because it's very economical. Object storage approaches the economics of tape. It's not as cheap as tape, but it is instantly accessible. I think everyone in, in the world has experienced data accessibility issues in, in one way, shape, or form in the last year. Now, most organizations have a requirement to keep data instantly accessible. This is why object storage is the storage tier that, that is growing the, the most. Uh, and I say that because if you take a look at cloud storage, cloud storage technologies, they are based on underlying object stores. So you combine what's going on in the cloud storage space, you combine what's going on in the object storage space, and you really see the scale, the need for keeping data online, keeping it accessible. This is one of the ways it's done by the way that object storage protects data and Swarm does this better than anyone in the market. Swarm has the most flexible way to protect content. You can specify life cycles that change the protection method automatically. It supports replication, which essentially is creating separate copies of a file, and erasure coding, which is very similar to RAID, to file level RAID, where you split up a specific file or specific object into different segments. And you can move from one or the other with Swarm. You enable distributed workflows. So, again, I spoke about you know, the ability to set up feeds. You see an example of the UI here where it's very easy to set up replication fees, feeds. Um, you can set up search feeds also. So if you want to continuously search for a specific uh, metadata query, you can go ahead and do that. But you, you can see how easy it is to add feeds via the UI. Of course, this is all available via the API. From a replication perspective, we support, Swarm supports synchronous, asynchronous, and stretch cluster replication uh, deployment models. You can also back up for disaster recovery purposes to any S3 compliant target. This means not only S3 as a service or Wasabi as a service, uh, Wasabi is, is, is a you know, very good partner of, of ours here at DataCore, uh, but you can also send to S3 compliant devices like Fujifilm's Object Archive. That's a tape-based object solution. So you can create a completely air-gapped and secure on-prem object storage solution that includes HDD, SSD, and tape with Swarm and Fujifilm. Um, so th th there's lots of different ways to deploy depending on what the requirements are. So, so you could provide you know, uh, services, public cloud services, or again, provide a, a completely air-gapped, highly secure object storage solution. I've mentioned content management a lot. Again, we, we do have a, a UI where administrators and end users can manage content. You can directly search for content. You can add metadata. Uh, you can actually do uh, clip, clip videos. Here's, here's an example of our video clipping uh, functionality that's integrated to the UI. You'll notice this little share button here. It's very easy to, to share files directly from the UI. Again, this is all managed on the Swarm UI. So at any time you want to revoke access, not only to the end user, but also to a specific piece of content, you can go ahead and do that. So we, again, we, we focus on making, managing, rapidly scaling data sets, unstructured data sets, easy to manage, not just from the infrastructure side, but also from the U, UI side. And then again, lowering storage costs. I, I just wanted to, to set the stage and set the example here of how Swarm stacks up to Amazon S3. Because a lot of the times that people are doing a, an analysis, do I go to the cloud, do I stay on-prem? This isn't a, an on-prem to on-prem comparison of, of a competitor. I wanted to compare it to the cloud. This is the, uh, the hot tier of, of Amazon. If you take a look at 570 terabytes of Amazon, uh, I just pulled these numbers yesterday, so these are, these are current for today. 
It's going to cost about 14000 per month. This is in the U.S. This does include three years of, of, or this does include AWS support. So if you take a look at that over three years, you're, you're looking at 504000 U.S. If you take a look at a comparable deployment with Swarm, this includes the underlying server resources. It comes out to roughly 194000 U.S. Of course, pricing is going to be variable, but I wanted to show that Swarm and on-prem at this scale is a lot more economical than the cloud. So you know, this is just setting the stage. Again, everyone's price is going to be variable. It really depends on, on what cost you're getting these servers at um, and, and um, you know, their overall capacity that you're purchasing. But you could start to see why on-prem object storage at a specific scale is more cost effective than the cloud. Now, again, th there are some reasons to go to the cloud. There's additional services that you plug into, but you, you can take a hybrid approach with the entire data core product line. This is where it would make sense to bring in San Symphony. It would, bring, it would make sense to bring in vPhilo, and you can architect a solution. But I wanted to show exactly what we're talking about when we talk about lower storage costs. There, there are a lot, lot of different other ways to lower your storage TCO. I went over a lot of the different ways in the previous slides. It would be up to you to determine you know, what your costs are for those specific functions within your organization to really determine the impact of your storage TCO, and, and we can work with you on that. Here, I wanted to show the reference deployments just to, just to show what a typical deployment for Swarm looks like. We do have reference architectures for these particular form factors for these one U uh, server form factors that are really optimized for storage. Again, I won't spend too much time on this slide, but it shows you the flexibility of Swarm. You can start with as, as low as, as one U, uh, 168 terabyte raw. The usable capacity is going to be based upon the protection method that you use. Obviously, if you're using three replicas, it's going to uh, you're going to use up more space than this 114. I believe this was used, or this, these were, uh, these are using a 5 to erasure coding scheme. I, I know that may not mean anything to a lot of people here, but, but again, we can work with you to determine the right uh, protection scheme, and the protection scheme uh, determines the, the nine durability. But you can see it's highly flexible for 500 terabytes. You can get 500 terabytes in 3U. Uh, the fourth U, this management node can be VMs. It runs all of the services. Uh, it's really a, you know, the interface services and the search services. This is where Elasticsearch uh, sits. You, you can install it on a server itself, but all of these services can also be run in VMs, and they're typically run by in, in VMs for for most organizations. You can see the you can see the um, the flexibility here. You know, you just kind of grow with the capacity needed. And then, you know, as you get into the multi petabyte range, you can have different form factors for servers. Again, Swarm is the most flexible solution out there from an x86 server architecture perspective. You can use servers from any vendor. Uh, these boxes that shown are from Supermicro, but you can use Lenovo, HP, Dell. Uh, again, we, we have had Swarm uh, in, in Cisco. Um, we've had Swarm installed on, on every major uh, OEM provider out there. And that, that's it. This is summarizing the, the key customer benefits, eliminate complexity and streamline deployments, simplify infrastructure and tenant management, meet any unstructured data workload, ensure long-term data availability, enable distributed workflows, uh, provide easy to manage content access, and of course, lower storage costs. It is the, the most economical way to add massively scalable storage for your new distributed and remote, remote workloads. I think everyone's struggling with distributed and remote workloads these days, and Swarm is a great way to satisfy those requirements. And with that, we'll go ahead and open it up to Q&A. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, just a reminder, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the question panel or the chat panel. Uh, we have a couple that have come up that um, I'll throw out to you, Adrian. Uh, first one, uh, actually, I can address. The uh, question was, uh, can people get a copy of these slides? So once this event is completed, you will get an email that has a link to the recording as well as a copy of these slides. So everybody will have those for reference. 
Um, one question came up was, uh, is there a live demo of the product that people can see? Yes, right right now there are demos of the product. There, there's a walkthrough on the Coringo site. It's called Swarm Walkthrough. Uh, we're we're working to move those uh, videos over to the the Data Core world as fast as we can. But um, you know, you just go to uh, Coringo.com and you look for walkthrough. If you can't find it, you can go ahead and, and email me uh, Adrian uh, Herrera at datacore.com and I can direct you to the right location. Mike, is there is there a way to share information where where everyone can access it on the data core side so we can post a link to those videos? Um yeah we, we can do that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but there there there, there is a walkthrough that we go over uh the, the tenant management, we go over the content management and uh, yeah, that that's that's the the beauty of of having a solution that is market hardened that's on version 12 technology. Um all the features, all the functions are very robust, and, and we do have those, those materials. Okay, uh, we've got several more questions coming in. Uh, first one, um, I'm not sure if you have answers to all these, but we'll throw them out there anyway and see how we do. Uh, okay. First one says, does Swarm have any integration with the vCloud Director? Um, I need to get back to you on that. I okay. I, I need to check. any. So any application, Swarm can plug into any application that leverages the S3 protocol. Um, you'll notice I don't say standard. S3 is not a standard. It's a protocol that's com controlled by Amazon. It's a moving target. And that's one of the things that we do very, very well is stay up to date on S3 support. That being said, you know, just because an application supports the S3 API, uh, doesn't mean that we work out of the box with it. We work with about 90% of the applications out there. There are some cases uh, where there need to be some minor tweaks on either the application side or the Swarm side to support it. But uh, usually if an application supports the S3 API, we, we will support it. As I mentioned, nine times out of 10, we'll support it out of the box. But I want to caveat that. I, I don't want to say all the time because there are some cases where there needs to be some minor adjustments. Um, but there has never been a, a, a scenario where an application supports S3 and it doesn't ultimately work with Swarm. Okay, thanks, Adrian. Uh, a couple more questions. Uh, next one is about the licensing model for this, and will there be an Essentials-like license for less than 100 terabyte scenarios? So Essentials is a version of Sand Symphony that's uh, a lower tier, less expensive version um, of sand symphony and i know you talked about the the typical range being between 100 terabyte and 100 petabyte so maybe you can talk about you know can you go lower than that and um, what's the scale at that level yeah so so we mentioned the typical range swarm is very flexible swarm can start at the single terabyte range it, it can be run in a vm um, there, there is there is a trial version of it so it can go lower than 100 terabytes. When we talk about the 100 terabyte range, we're talking about that. That's that's where it really becomes more economical to move to a pure object store. Under under that terabyte range, or under that 100 terabyte range, it, it may be more economical to um, to just use the the S3 interface and and be Philo and and store on an existing you know storage infrastructure. But to answer your question, yes, we can go under 100 terabyte. Um, it, it's easy enough to to uh, develop a solution. We we don't recommend going under the 50 terabyte threshold. Technically, there's no reason. It, it's it's really just uh, from an economics perspective and an infrastructure perspective. You know, you really start getting the value of of pure object storage at the 100 terabyte range. Technically, there's no reason you can't go below that. So, Mike, I mean, you you may be in a better position to talk about licensing. I, I but you know starting small and scaling big is something that could be done and, and you know providing a, a, a smaller license is something that we can absolutely do. Okay. Yeah. Um, looks like we got several questions here about how is um, the product licensed? Is it perpetual or uh, subscription or term uh, is the term we use? Um, so several questions along those lines. So maybe you can talk to that. Sure. We're we're working on a term licensing model. Uh, and you know, we're, we're working as fast as we can on that. You know, for now, uh, you know, contact your your data core representative 
and you know they'll direct the questions internally. But but it will be a, a term-based model. Okay, here's another one from our um, Central European region. Uh, are there any plans to talk with getting predefined systems, mostly based on Supermicro, to ramp up the sales very quickly? We have those reference architectures ready to go. So the the reference architectures, that waterfall diagram that I showed uh, with the servers flowing down, we we have those specs ready ready when you are. So you know if if you have uh, opportunities right now, uh, just go ahead and send an email to prod product marketing p r o d m k t g at datacore.com and we can help you out. But we absolutely have the reference architectures for those super micro devices that you saw. Uh, both the, the one U storage server, the one U management server, and the four U storage server. So we have all the specifications that that you need. And I'll put a link. Uh, I'll put that email address in the chat for everyone to see. Um, one more question uh, that popped up: um, Do we have detailed head-to-head -head comparisons with other on-premise object storage players? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Okay, and so again, we go we go over that, and yeah, we 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 do have those. Um, obviously, those, those are those are for you know partners and and uh, and employees, and and but we we do have have that information uh, for for most for most major object stores. Okay, and, and I dropped that uh, email alias that uh, Adrian mentioned into the chat for everyone, so we can uh, if you need detailed competitive information, just drop us a note. We can help you out there. Uh, looks like we got a couple more questions rolling in. Uh, does Swarm support S3 object block? I need to get back to you on that. I I, I will um, if you want to capture that information. I'm not okay. sure exactly where we are. I know uh, I know we were working on it. I I, I just don't want to uh, to miss misspeak. I'm not sure if if it made it out to uh, in, in in the latest release in, in version 12. Okay, Maurice, we'll, we'll get with you after the event and uh, give you a, a detailed uh, answer on that question. Yeah. Uh, next one, uh, let's see. Um, do you do you have bills for Dell, HPE, and, and, and Lenovo? Uh, we we do have reference architectures for some of those. Uh, we, I, I need to check how current they are. Um, I know Dell, we, we have, but let, 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 I, I need to check on HP and Lenovo. Super micro, I know for sure. But, um, you know, the specifications, uh, you, you could get, you know, similar boxes across the vendors. Uh, but again, that's, that's something I'll, I'll look into and I'll get back to, to the person asking that. Okay, and uh, final question because we're running a uh, low on time here is on training and certification. Uh, are there any available programs for customers or partners to get trained on Swarm? We are working on a DCSP module, uh, working as fast as we can. Hopefully, that'll come out in in the next you know week or so, or next uh, coming weeks, I should say, coming weeks. And then following that, we'll have DCIE, DC, DC, what is it, DCSA, Mike? DCIE, DCSA? DCSA, yeah, and DCSA. DCSA. Yeah. Yeah, DCA. Um, th those, those will take a, a little bit longer, but the DCSP training uh, should, should come soon uh, within the next few weeks. Okay, I think we've yeah. hit all the questions in the chat. So with that, I want to thank everyone uh, for attending today's webinar. Thank you, um, uh, Adrian, for the presentation, uh, very insightful. And again, a reminder to everyone, a link to this uh, recording of this webinar and the slides will be sent to you afterwards. Thank you and have a great day, everyone. Thanks, everyone.